Hey everybody, Adrian here, one of the co-hosts of Sidebar Forever, the new version of the former Sidebar Pop Culture Podcast. Every month, Sidebar Forever posts brand new episodes discussing and examining pop culture and art-related topics. However, as a bonus and a reminder to listeners who followed us in our previous incarnation, we're representing some of our vintage back episodes. Many of our classic interviews and roundtables will once again be available in our podcast feed. So, please enjoy this back episode from the Barchives, and don't forget to subscribe to Sidebar Forever on SidebarForever.com, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or anywhere else you get your podcast. And hey, follow us on our socials, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so you don't miss a single new episode of Sidebar Forever. Hello, Drew. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Wow. Good, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. Again, this is Swain, just so you can get our voices. Right, and my name's Dwight. How are you doing, Drew? I'm good. So Swain's the one I can hardly hear, and Dwight, I hear just fine. Okay. okay. I'm the one you can hardly hear? Yeah. Okay, what about, uh, let's see, what about now? Is that any better? Oh, there now it is, yeah. Okay, and you can hear Dwight okay? Yeah. Oh, now oh. I can't tell you apart. Okay. okay. Well, we, <laughs> we solved one problem and created another. <laughs> that's okay. I can't tell people apart unless I can see them anyway. Well, yeah, that's. I guess that could be the case. And oddly enough, I typically do a lot better in a in live situation yeah, in person than right. I do on the telephone. So uh, I hope I won't offend you by using colorful language. But I'm scared shitless, and I got to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I do colorful stuff all day, so I get it. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Can you put that on the web? <laughs> sure, we can. I, yeah, we definitely can. With your well, permission. shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Uh, well, once again, I, you know, Dwight and I definitely want to thank you for doing this. Um, mm-hmm. I know that you're a super busy guy, as I said in the email. I'm being redundant, but you know, we we're absolutely astounded that you would take the time out of your schedule to holler well, at a couple of okie dokes in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, I might. I like to meet people. That's nice. And, but you're right. I'm really busy, and it's late, and I'm tired. I've been working here since 6 a.m., so I'm a bit shot. Are you really? Yeah, so you're not seeing me at my best. Okay. Well, I mean, we we definitely won't hold it against you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, um, I did want to kind of get through a couple of couple of quick things, I guess, before we got started in our conversation. But mm-hmm. the... The one thing I guess that I we have to be honest about is is we've been debating as to how your last name is pronounced. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have absolutely no idea how you're supposed to or if if there is such a thing. Really? Okay. Yeah, I'm, you know, my parents uh, didn't tell me anything or didn't teach me anything and that was one of the things they forgot to say. So was how to pronounce your last name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it used to be uh, a Polish by way of French or Bohemia and it used to be like Struzanski. Okay. But, you know, people came over to America and they wanted to fit in, so they shortened it and took the ski off. Okay. So I don't know if it's Struzan or Struzan. Uh, you know, I answer to Drew. Okay. Yeah, well, that happened a lot back when, you know, the immigrants were coming in. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I have to ask, is that clicking I hear, the easel moving back and forth? Oh, <laughs> that's your time running out. Oh, oh is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I turned off the fan. I turned off the air conditioner. No, 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 no. no, no. Now we... I stopped the clock, so no. <laughs> we're in the twilight zone. So, right so we've got the next four hours solid, Drew Struz, and 6 a.m. to, you know, to 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, wishful thinking. Very right. presumptuous on my part. I'm I'm flabbergasted, sir. I don't know what, what to say about this situation, actually. <laughs> We're a couple of well, schoolgirls. Yeah, I was just writing a guy that wants to do an interview for his website, and uh, I just told him, you know the old saying, you know, better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, we're here to remove doubt. There we go. <laughs> that's there we it. go. You you mentioned uh, your last name and and I guess the the somewhat ambiguity on pronouncing it and that was one of the things I guess I wanted to ask was 
how long ago did you decide to start signing your stuff just as Drew rather than Suzanne or Struzan or you know or whichever it may be? Because you have a great well, a well, great French, last name. Struzan. Yeah, Struzan. Cool. Struzan. Yeah. Struzan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I have no idea, but I've seen drawings from when I was three and four years old and I was signing them Drew then. Oh really? And I just always have, I think. Okay. I mean, there were instances when I put my last name, but not since I've been professional or doing anything of note. Right. Okay. And you just prefer to be known as Drew anyway, right? Yeah, I prefer it, you okay. know, for many a reason. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little bit sick, so uh, I may cough a bit during the time when oh, we're talking. Oh, that's so. Well, I've been coughing since I was 25, so <laughs> okay. I'll chime in with you. <laughs> Maybe we can do it in stereo. Yeah. <laughs> Drew, I... The, your book, Ouvre, which I af- absolutely love, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Uh, well, again, I'm not French, so I don't know. Okay, so, yeah, we can take license then. Okay. <laughs> but it's a gorgeous book, and I was curious if, um, obviously, the publisher and or the writers approached you about doing it and putting it together? Yeah, the publisher did. Okay, Dreamwave. And uh-huh. a lot of the, uh, in reading a lot of the stuff in there, particularly the um, uh, George Lucas's foreword. Um, yeah. He, he was. He had all, all obviously very kind things to say, and, and I'm sure he meant every bit of it. But I was wondering if <laughs> I, somehow I don't like the way that that sounded. <laughs> well, I just think it's funny you say. I'm sure he meant it. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Sidebar's first and last interview with True Strews. <laughs> exactly. Well, he didn't have his secretary write it. Believe me, uh, it didn't sound like it, but. But when people compare you as as an illustrator, compare you to you know the you know the guys that obviously came a generation and whatnot before you, like Parrish and Rockwell and Wyeth, are you flattered by that, or do you try not to pay attention to it, or because you seem kind of like a down to earth guy, so I, I wouldn't imagine. Yeah, well, I like the way you put it. I don't pay attention to it. Okay. Um, it goes way back with me again. You know you, how you're stuck with your parents and they get in your head and, and make you think things and right. and uh, one thing i do is forget a lot let's see what was the question um, <laughs> oh yeah what do i think of flattery and stuff um, yeah. when you when you compare it to I, other greats i have very little self-confidence because of my childhood so i i never had a birthday party and until my 60th when my wife threw me a party really? but yeah you know, never celebrated things in uh, my parents willfully did not acknowledge my talent and what I was doing, so so that it made me very insecure. Wow. So I, I find it very difficult. You know, we're getting into psychology now, but okay. I find okay. it difficult to believe that you can anybody lay down. Get, like that. Yeah, anybody gives a damn about what I do. Uh, we do, and I don't pay much attention to to the, those kinds of things when people say them because I don't particularly believe it. I admire. Those those other illustrators and artists you mentioned, and I obviously take a lot from history and, and learned a lot. But I'm still, you know, trying to do my best and trying to learn every day. So I just I don't take it in. Well, we kind of like that. when people say, "What's your favorite piece of art?" Right. Well, I basically tell them I can't have a favorite because what right. I'm trying to do is get better every day. Right. Right. If I had a favorite, all I'd do is be trying to repeat what I did. Right. Rather than trying to advance. So, again, it's it's just this mentality of, of not thinking that much of myself and and not accepting the the praise into my heart that much. Right. But you, surely you must know, sir. I mean, with all of, uh, with utmost humility, you, you are an awesome artist. I mean, you are the artist that a lot of people revere and look to to for examples and when they go in, when they go to school to learn how to do it. And I, know, and I know you've heard that, you know, probably. Yeah, the last all three of them years. have said that before. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I already told. Yeah, I hear it, but I I just kind of you know everybody has a right to his opinion, I suppose. Right. And they have theirs, and I have mine. Exactly. I know that Bernie Fuchs and Bob Peake kind of preceded you mm-hmm. as a professional illustrator. Mm-hmm. And when you saw their stuff, because, I mean, oftentimes when, when Dwight and I were like kids, teenagers, and we were interested in art, we um, your name would be spoken in those same circles even though they pre- preceded you. What was your opinion of their stuff when you saw it as a young art student or as a young guy before you actually entered the professional ranks? Well... You know, when I was in school, they had already graduated and were off doing their thing and, and making good money and a good name for themselves. But most of my studies, well, 
I graduated supposedly as an illustrator. Most of my studies were more in fine art. You know, I learned to draw classically, and I learned to compose from history, and and I try to gather all I can from the past so that I'm not repeating what someone else has done right. and then adding it to my own personality and hopefully making something new that is appropriate for our age. And I really didn't study or have much knowledge of other illustrators. It really wasn't until much later when I was working and I started running across other people's work that I became familiar with, with Bob Peek or Bernie Fuchs that you mentioned. And of course, I love their stuff. It's, it's wonderful stuff, but they drew and painted in their time, which was a little different than my time. So. Right. Um, well, well, Bernie Fuchs never did movie posters. Bob Peek did many, obviously. Right, right. And when I fell into movie poster work, I wasn't looking at other the history of movie posters because I wasn't really knowledgeable about that or about the history of illustrators particularly. So I just took what was my education and my taste and approached the job, which is probably one why, why excuse me, why my work wound up different and looked fresh because I wasn't really being redundant or copying somebody else or right. another person's style. Right. It just kind of was my own. What you have to understand is I am a working man. Yes, sir. Right. You know, people really misunderstand who I am because they don't know me. They know the work. Right. right. And I really like that because that's me at my best. Okay. And, what and I've the studied, way... what I do every day and every night, all my life was paint and draw. And this is how I express myself. So I'm not particularly acute verbally. I'm not an intellectual. I'm a painter. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. But I just do it here. I'm all alone. You can hear how it sounds in my studio. It's yeah. perfectly quiet, and I sit here all day long painting. And then the work goes out, and all the world sees it, and it makes it seem like I'm powerful or connected or something that I'm really not. That's a good I'm just a painter. And if people like it, that's that's the whole point. That's the reason I do it, well, aside from being paid. but <laughs> <laughs> Money helps. <laughs> but it's, it's like all famous people. People get the wrong idea who they are. Mm -hmm. I'm somebody that, that, okay, I have some talent, some education, and some ability, and that's being used to, to make the world a prettier place. Um, praise the work, I'm glad. But me, I'm just another human being, you know. Mm -hmm. I just uh, eat and drink and sleep and work. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. Well, and you do it very well. At least the the work part. <laughs> you know, I the can't speak to the eating and okay. yeah, the eating and drinking and sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so, you uh, know, it's, it's, so I understand that's who I am because I sit here all day and I don't paint with. There's not cheerleader around here. Right. No one's playing a band and telling me how great I am. I'm. I'm actually trying to please clients, and it's very difficult. Yeah. Every job's a new, a new test of what I can think and what I can create and what I can do, and it's very difficult and it's very hard. And it, it don't feel like I'm being praised. You know, I just right. feel like I'm working. That's right. interesting. Even at this point, they still test you to your limits, or they try to come up with something that's different to throw a loop at you, or. Well, every job's a new job, and right. every job is a different person. So they all have, they have their okay. their needs, intents, and personalities. So right. it's, it's not like going to your job every day where you know everybody around you and you know if you're doing a good job or not, and you know who the boss is and how to please them. You right. know? I mean, that's how I got through school. I never read a book, but I learned how to please the teachers, so I did fine. Right. But now every day, can you imagine a person that goes to a job every day doing, doing my job? Where it's, you don't know what's going to hit you in the face during exactly. the day, and you, you don't know how to please this new person you're talking to. Right. Do you still get hit, like, at the last minute for something to be done in two days, like a movie? The movie's done, and all the posts is done, the movie's ready to go, and they don't have a poster, and they still call you, like, at the very last minute? Uh, well, being old and tired, I... I... <laughs> you turn, you turn I that away. <laughs> if they know it or I just turn it down, but I tell them i got to have more time than that. Okay. But... But still, I'm so busy that I can't take a job in a day anyway because I already have commitments to other people. So place. I'm working on their dotted lines, so they have to kind of get in line if they want a job. You know? you, mm. you're, you're pretty fast, though, aren't you? Well, relative to many other artists I am, but that doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't take weeks to do a painting. Right. 
The, uh, no, I'm not as fast as a computer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Touche. <a> <laughs> right. Yes. So, you know, I start, start with a whiteboard and I start drawing a painting, you know. Right. That's interesting. Um, after all these years, it, being a freelancer, does it still appeal to you in the same way as when you first broke out on your own? Because I know you worked for Pacific E&E for a while. Pioneer, yeah. Um, yeah, just two years. Okay. Well, yeah. I did that because I, I was out on my own after school and I couldn't get a job, you know. I mean, my first year at school, I worked, I was literally putting in 24 hours a day, you know, doing over 100 hours of work a week. And after a whole year, I earned $3,000. Wow. wow. And in that year, we paid $1,500 for the birth of my son. Right. So, so um, wow. I quit freelancing and, and tried to find a job in a studio so I could get a paycheck and, you know, take care of the family. Right. So I took that job, and it paid me a paycheck, and that was very pleasant. Um, but what it also did for me is it taught me more than what I got in school, which was just practical painting knowledge, but this was more applicable to working in the field. So I learned all about working with people, pleasing clients, um, all the mechanical necessities of my job and how to add the type to the work and printing and meeting deadlines and, you know, just all the things that are necessary to become really uh, a practicing professional. So I did that for two years, and after two years, I had stuff printed every day because I was working for clients and it was being printed and people started to to see it and recognize it and like it. So I, the studio I was working for started getting calls from other clients saying, oh, we'd like to have that guy that's working there paint pictures for me. And this is when you were doing album covers? Yeah, album covers basically, okay. lots of stuff though. Okay. And, and then I started to realize that I really didn't need to uh, – to be working for a boss anymore. I could go back to freelancing because I finally had a portfolio that showed I could, you know, do professional work. And from that day on, I've been busy. I'm like, can you give us just an idea of what's, you know, what that, what the growth has been from there to now in terms of, I, I guess... doubt it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I... That's like, that's like analyzing my life, which I don't do. You know, right, okay. I, I live now and I live Day by with day. hopes for the future, but right. I really don't focus on the past. Okay. I can say that, yes, when I got into doing so many movie posters, I found out that it's a very specific kind of uh, job. Okay. You have to understand the the industry, their needs, their taste, and their way of doing things. So part of the learning process was learning <laughs> the industry itself so that okay. I knew how to do the job better. And now, you know, let's kind of know the ins and outs of all of it. So it, it's much easier than it was then. And I'm not doing it in ignorance because I got a lot a lot of stuff behind me. Gotcha. But uh, much more than that, I can't tell you. I mean, things have changed. I mean, there were no computers when I started. There was no digital photography, you know. Right. I mean... When I started and, and did work, I didn't have a scrap file. I had to start a scrap, scrap file. I didn't know where to get pictures to paint from. And right, okay. I used to, I used a Polaroid. That's what I used to paint from. Really? Wow. Yeah, and then then I got a 35 millimeter camera, and we had to learn how to develop and print pictures. And I did that for a long time. Then we had one hour photos, so I could take the pictures <laughs> in, and one hour later have them printed all right. nice for me. And you know, and then it changed to digital, and then you know. The rest is history, as it were. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, I'm a dinosaur. I've, I've gone through all the different changes, and it's changed the way we work. And again, with the computer, it's changed again. Because I right. mean, I used to. They used to send me the still books from you know a movie shoot, and I go through thousands of pictures and choose them, and they'd have to print up eight by tens for me. Nowadays, they call me on the phone. And they just send it over email, or they right. send me a DVD. You know. Right. So it's, I mean. I haven't been on a studio lot well, once. I went earlier this year, but it's been years. I just rarely go see anybody anymore. Okay. Um, I mean, used to go on the set. I used to, to go and, and see a screening of the movie and sit there with the director, and, and mm-hmm. he'd tell me all about it. And felt, you know, really connected. Nowadays, I'm not connected with anybody. I never wow. leave the studio because of the digital world we live in. 
So it was a much more immersive process, you would say, back then, I guess. Yeah, very much so. It was more respectful because, well, see, what hasn't changed in the digital world is the best communication and the best understanding is still person to person. Right. And when that doesn't happen, it makes the job harder again. Mm-hmm. Right. So I used to be able to, to read what people wanted and be able to do one or two ideas, and they'd be pleased, and now I have to do many, many jobs, and I'm pleasing the third man down the line and has to go to the second man before he gets to the first man, so there's no direct communication anymore. You see, I guess to me, Drew, that's what kind of throws me off because you're Drew Struzan, and you have... See, I told you, you had the wrong view. <laughs> I told you, I'm just a silly guy sitting here painting pictures. Right, but your portfolio is 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 international. People see your stuff in many various variations and forms all across the world. If they can't pick out a picture and say, I want it like this, you know, <laughs> what, what's the point? I don't understand. I, I think, I think the, the, the point that Dwight is making is it's, it's kind of like an actor who has a body of work and he doesn't audition anymore. Right. You, you know what he can do. Right. Either higher well, for the I didn't job say or I was auditioning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that, that's that where all my work comes from. I right. mean, I don't, I don't advertise. I don't carry a portfolio. Right. right. Uh, yeah. all, all my stuff comes in. Basically, people uh, want work. They write an email. Right, right. And they ask, you know, do you want the, here's the job. Do you want to do it? Do you have the time and do you have the money? Well, that, that brings and, me to an interesting point, Drew. And I do work internationally. I mean, I've done right. Lots of work in Europe over the last couple of years just because of the very things you're saying. Right. Okay. They see the work. That's what they want. They're tired of the computer images, and they say, let's go back to painting, and they give me a call. Right. Excellent. Yeah, so I'm very approachable that way because I still have to work every day. Mm-hmm. And on, on your site, it does say, you know, in, you know, any job, big or small, if, you know, mm-hmm. if we can meet the budget and the deadline yeah, and, right. uh, and agree upon, you know, what it's going to be, then you're open for it. Well, there's a lot of guys like you that think, oh, I'm this guy, right? He's right. untouchable. There were a couple of years there where I couldn't get any work because that's what people were thinking. Interesting. Really? You know, yeah, well, it's just, we can't call him. So they were using a lot of the imitators that could do it for half the price, you know? Right. So that's why I put that on my site. Hey, I'm here working. Give me a job. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, but uh, I guess it worked because everybody calls now, but... Uh, if someone were to offer you, Drew, uh, an, another steady kind of a gig like the one you had at Pacific, would that be something that would in any way appeal to you now, or are you just too used to the freedom and the autonomy? Right. Uh, there's no way I would do that. Okay. <laughs> it has its benefits and its drawbacks, but I'm, you know, along with the, the pretended modesty, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. You know, that okay. that makes me want to be alone, and I have to. I mean, it's like my son. I trained him as an artist, and he can paint and draw and do all the great stuff. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. But he just, he, he did it for like two years, and then he just said, I can't do this because he's an extrovert. He said, i got to be around people. i got to, you know, right. moving and shaking and driving fast. And he says, I like to just sit here at quiet at home with my own thoughts. Mm-hmm. So I like being alone, and mm-hmm. I like working in the quiet, and... You know that's that's introverted kind of thing. My when I'm in crowds, they suck the power out of me. When I'm alone, I gain power. Ah. You know, an extrovert is the opposite. When they're alone, they feel like they're starving, and then when they get with other people, then they they get all their power back. So that's kind of the difference between an introvert and extrovert. So being alone is really good for me and good for my work. Mm-hmm. If I may ask, you mentioned your son. Does he work for you? I know he's the creative. Oh no, he has his own design studio okay. in Burbank. Okay. So he's got a bunch of employees and does his thing. Okay. Well, I noticed his name on the book, so I didn't know if he was working for you or for. You. Well, he he put it all together. He designed it and okay. did all the you know the typography and everything for me. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. That's excellent. The, uh, do you mind if we ask about it, some of the projects that you've done and just kind of get, you know, just a, a general kind of a quickie response? Or... Well, if I can remember. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know. Some of them, you know, go back 20, 25 years or so. But uh, I guess the Raiders movies and the poster work that you did for those movies. and Yeah, for the Indiana Jones Indiana stuff. Jones, yes, sir. Yeah, only the first one was Raiders. 
Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I, I guess that's just the colloquialism that I use. <laughs> right. That's cool. We just want to make your audience understand what you're Ex- talking exactly. about. Exactly. I appreciate the clarity. Thank you. That Thank should you. be your job, but yeah. it has to be sometimes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's the exactly. job of the interviewee to, to straighten the, uh, the guy out. <laughs> But uh, for the well, that's basically what we've been doing. I you know, have all these misconceptions. I know, and telling you your outer mind. I know. We should mind. call this interview the uh, the clearing up, uh, the, the uh... demystifying a true truth. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. See, that's my problem. See, I like being a mystery. Right. It and you said that. You said that in the email. Yeah. You said yeah. That. Well, you know, then they think I'm the guy you think I was until I started talking. <laughs> Um, but uh, as far as the uh, Indiana Jones movies, the very first one, it, the, the, the story I understand is is that you know you didn't have any kind of a real synopsis of the movie. You just had some stills and maybe like a paragraph, and that was it. That yeah, that's true. Okay, yeah, and then, I just had a little paragraph that explains sort of what it was about, and they gave me a handful of pictures, did, and did that you, was it. Yeah. Did, did you get any sense from even that little bit that it would be as as classic and, and as endearing as it, as it ended up being? No, you never know. That's the thing. They, people always ask, how cool was it to work on that? You know, says, well, at the time, it was a movie that was unreleased, and we never knew where it was going. Okay. You know, it's, it's like Star Wars, you know, a B-movie, science fiction, who cares, you know? Right. So you're starting this thing, and it's just another job for me. Because, you know, one day I'm doing a romantic comedy, and the next day I'm doing an adventure, and the next day it's science fiction, and the next day is another job, you right. know, so... Working on Indy was another job. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it was cool to work with with Spielberg and Lucas, but at the time I wasn't talking with them. Right. I got the job from a design studio who had been given the the, the job, and they called me. Okay. You, you mentioned Star Wars, the um, the circus poster thing. Why do they call that the circus poster? I have absolutely no idea. Jeez. Some, you know, guy writing in the newspaper. You know, coin the phrase, and it's just stuck. Who's the fellow that you worked on that with? You did the figures, and oh, he did Charlie the... White. Charlie White, okay. Uh-huh. And he did the yeah. machines and the and the robots and stuff, and you did the people, right? Well, just to show you, how, you know, to to get real humble about this and, and let you see how it really works, I I never received the job again from from Lucasfilm or from 20th Century Fox. Charlie Charlie White. He had a design studio, and he was an airbrush artist, a really great one. And, yeah. and he got the job, and he d- designed the poster and gave me a call. He said, look, you know, I'm doing this poster, and it has portraits in it, and I can't do portraits. Do you want to share a piece of art? If you paint the portraits, I'll paint the rest of it. Cool. I said, yeah, sure. I'd be, you know, honored to work with you and do something with you. Mm-hmm. And I was more excited about that than uh, until I figured out what the project was about. But that's kind of how it happened. So I, I painted, you know, Luke and Leia, and then he paint, I painted that in oil, and then he did airbrushing around it and painted, you know, R2 and the land speeder and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And somebody else painted the lettering at the top. Okay. Production studio <laughs> style of, uh, of working. Yeah, because you know that's he—he he was kind of full service kind of thing. See, I'm not full service. I just paint pictures. You know? Right. But, <laughs> well, you were full so service. So we did that, and then afterwards, well, which was really funny, and then then he designed it, and then he went to put the billing block on there. And there's a thing that most people don't realize, and that's there's there's contracts about how the title and the billing block and the above title. Right stuff goes and, and it tells you what size and scale or relationship they have to be so mm-hmm. he painted this huge title and we went to put the billing block in and keep the names the right size according to the contract it wouldn't fit <laughs> it would have been <laughs> four times bigger than the space he had so we had to go back and redesign the poster with a whole bunch of space at the bottom right. and that's how it wound up looking like a wild posted picture with the pictures on the side and stuff yeah so we painted that later, and that was kind of like, you know, the mother of invention, as we say, because mm-hmm. he made a mistake. <laughs> and some goober came along and called it the circus poster, and mm-hmm. and that's that stuck. Yeah, I don't know who the goober was. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was again, that's who I see it is. It was just another job. Of course, yeah. you know, I've been doing this since 1977, so 30 years that I've been doing Star Wars stuff. Wow. You know, but I, I did those things. I did it. See, I don't remember the date, but I, it was on the job hook for Spielberg. Yes, sir. 
he had a big after filming you know rap party mm -hmm. it was a huge party and everybody in hollywood came and he actually invited me so as the wallflower introvert that i <laughs> am i i just kind of stood against the wall on the back of the room with my wife and we just kind of watched the parade go by right <laughs> and and while we were standing there i don't know when that was it was like in the 80s or something mm -hmm. um and i've been working i don't know late 80s maybe even i don't know 10 15 years i've been working for lucasfilm never met george but at this party we're sitting there against standing there against the wall and my wife goes you know there was this guy across the the aisle just standing there just like me not doing anything just kind of watching everybody she goes boy that guy looks like george lucas <laughs> <laughs> so, so I walked over and introduced myself. It was George Lucas. No. <laughs> First time I'd ever met him after all those years of working for him. I had never met him before that. Well, it was really funny. It was so loud at those parties. All I could do was say, hi, I'm Drew. Nice to meet you. And he, he says, hi, I'm George. Nice to meet you. And we just kind of stood there and looked at each other. So I walked away. And you went back to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it turns out he's, we're almost identical personalities. He's very quiet and very introverted as well. Right. But so later, I found some friends sitting at a table. So I, I, I went over and sat by, and I said, "You'll never guess who was just sitting at our table. It was George Lucas, and he was so excited. He goes, you'll never guess who I just met. <laughs> I just oh, met Drew. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's so cool. he's just a guy too, you know. He's just right. another person doing his job. And right. We all think he's everybody else is somebody fantastic." So even George Lucas feels that way. Well, we're in good company then. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, we're all just people, man. Uh, and uh, as I deal with these people and get to know them, you see that, you know. There's mm -hmm. some just really delightful, sweet, kind, gentle people in this industry. You know, we get a bad rap out here for some reason, but believe me, I only work with good people, and, you know, people like George or Stephen. Or, when you say out here, you mean Californians? Yeah, well, Hollywood. Okay, okay. okay. Really, really cool people. I've, you know, ever since then, George and I have been really good friends, and we get along famously. You know, mm -hmm. well, that's wonderful. I thought it was interesting. I was uh, that I had read a, a, a quote that the, the, the book art that or the cover art that you did for the Bantam books for Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Um, that originally they, I guess, had tried to go another route, and eventually they said, "Well, let's get the guy who did the movie poster." And I thought it was kind of cool that your artwork has indelibly been connected with this property. And the stylization of it. Yeah, to the point now where people won't really feel like it's authentic unless they see the Drew image to go along with it. Exactly. And, and I was curious if that's ever happened with any other uh, properties or IPs that you've worked, worked on. Well, I think it's curious that you would say that because I've heard that. I didn't really know that other people understood that. You know, but, I mean, Lucasfilm feels that way. That's why George had me do all the posters. He figures if it's not mine, it's not legitimate. But. That's indie. I mean, I'm working on indie four now. Yeah. How's that and, coming, by the way? Well, getting started. In fact, I was working on an indie picture today. Ooh. And, um, but it's the same way. I had a meeting with Paramount last month, and they got us all ready to go. And they said, the reason you're here is because we feel that uh, if you don't do the poster, it's not authentic. So indie's the same way, mm -hmm. you know. That's awesome. There are a lot of projects. When when Jim Hansen was alive, mm -hmm. he basically considered me the Muppet poster artist because as long as he was around, he didn't want anybody else but me drawing the Muppets because he thought the way I did them was the way they should be done. I agree. So there's, yeah, there's another uh, number of other things that were the same way. I mean, it was that way on Police Academy. And, mm -hmm. I remember those in Cannonball Run and... Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's happened before, you know. You know, there's only so many uh, movies that keep going like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like, Back to the Future was the same way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So would you say that, would you say that, Drew, would you say that um, less is more in terms of what you give people to choose from as far as design designs go, or do you continue, continue to give them as much as they're requesting? requesting? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> Do it, the boss says. Yeah, okay. Say <laughs> you know, there another. are times when I have a good relationship with them, and I'll do just one or two ideas, right. and they'll go, "That's cool, go for it." Right. In fact, that happened last year on Pan's Labyrinth. Uh, Guillermo wanted me to do a painting, and he says, "Look, we had a hard time with Hellboy. You painted the picture, and they didn't use it. So I don't have any fantasies about." 
what I'm asking you to do. Paint what you think my movie's about. Okay. I just want Excellent. you to make a picture. If they use it, fine. If they don't, I don't care. I just want a picture. So he <laughs> came over me. and he goes, okay, I have a bunch of ideas. I want to I want to tell you what I'm thinking about my movie and what I think you should be doing. And I said, well, I already have an idea. Let me show that to you first. And I had like on a four by five pad of paper, I had just taken a pencil and just drew it. I mean, literally in 15 seconds, what I thought the poster should be. I showed him that drawing. He says, that's perfect. Do it. Wow. So that's all I did on that. So, and I painted exactly what I showed him and they didn't use it. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> wow. But he was very happy. So it was just one piece. I did, I did some earlier this year for Frank Darabont's new film, The Mist. Hmm. And I did just three drawings for him, and he fell in love with two of them. And in fact, one of them was printed for the, uh, the giveaway at Comic Con a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Did you attend Comic Con? Yeah, I was there. Really? You okay. didn't pick me out from the 180,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, we weren't able to attend. But I was going to ask oh. if you if you if you normally go, you know. No, I don't do anything normally. Okay. <laughs> but the only thing I do normally is sit in here and paint. <laughs> okay. Uh, I go when somebody asks me to go. Okay. Like Frank had that poster there, and they were doing a, a what do you call it? We you all know, sit behind the table and answer questions like a panel. <laughs> a panel. <laughs> so, so he invited me to go, so I went to, to support his efforts. You know, and okay. we signed posters and stuff. But uh, I don't, I don't like crowds. I already told you. Yeah, right. It sucks you know, the life so, out of you. Yeah, so and I can I understand that to a certain. I don't way. usually do that, cause, right. uh, but you know. You gotta support your friends, right? So I did. Yeah. The uh, are you, do you keep account? And I I know the answer to this before I even ask you, but do you keep <laughs> account? I, I know it's like you know, I'm digging the hole keep as account I, of the injury as yeah, I step I got into this it. Black book. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, my in my research it says you've done over 150 posters. Do you know movie posters? Do you know what you're up to now? I don't count. Okay. No, yeah. No, I, mean, so, I didn't. I somehow didn't suspect you did. It's a rounded off number. You know, I I couldn't really tell you. Okay. I mean, what am I gonna? I don't even have a place where I've got them all listed. You know, I'd have to go individually and count them, and probably miss a bunch of them, and right. find them later. And I mean, there's there's guys around this world, speaking of fans and people who know the work, that that collect it, and they. They'll find images and send them to me and say, "Is this yours?" And it's stuff I did back in the early seventies, <laughs> yeah, stuff in the sixties, you know. And they and they go, "See, I forgot I even did that." Yeah, I guess I'll have to add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> so, it I, you know, that's what comes of not living in the past. I mean, and you see how it it's a job for me when I'm doing it. Do you do you ever go through blocks or dry spells in in the midst of of trying to please clients and and if so you mean you... creative dry spells or yeah. work dry spells? Well, well, I, you mentioned about work dry spells before, but uh, just creative dry spells where you know you just can't seem to come up with something that pleases you and or them. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I I guess that happens to people where they have writer's block or whatever, you yeah. know, but. Um, I'm always getting ideas in my head and can't wait for the opportunities to do them. Hmm. You know, even when I'm illustrating, when I have free time, how do I fill it? You know, I don't go skiing. I don't go out in my boat or, you know, go well, what, shooting what, what seagulls. Do you, what, do you do when you're not, what do you do when you're not painting, though? Are you just I spend paint. time with you? Okay. <laughs> That's what I do. Because I have my head's full of things I want to do, so okay. I paint, you know. So. That's pretty awesome. Fact, you know, I just... I got a huge collection of paintings that nobody's ever even seen, you know. I, All just, right. do, I just do them for me. Well, feel free to email us some scans. <laughs> yeah. if, if you think that the world should know, we can start it right here at the uh, Steam sidebar well, microphone. Well, these paintings exactly. are not like my illustrations. They're very different. You That's probably okay. couldn't even tell that I had done them. Different well, some of the sir. stuff in Uvra, the some of the nudes and some well, of the I guess other there stuff. are a couple things in there. That's true. Yeah, and I was I was showing them to a uh, a buddy of mine earlier today, and, and and he was like, "Well, wow, this is really different from this other stuff." And I said, "Well, yeah, this is obviously either personal, or you know, a commission that someone asked for, but this is definitely not like you know the movie stuff." Okay, so I'm full of shit. You have seen them. <laughs> <laughs> Part of them, anyway. Yeah, well, there's just through a smattering of them, and they're just uh, to. Tease people, I suppose. You know? Right. Yeah. 
I took up sculpture last year, so I'm doing some sculpting and wow. painting on the side. So I really don't have time for anything else. Is That's there a book in the works, uh, possibly, of Drew, Drew Struzan's uh, sculptures? Because <laughs> no. we love to. Okay. Right. Is, 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 is it too right. early on for that? <laughs> no. I mean, it's even like the Oeuvre book. You know, that was supposed to be a, a, a two book, a two volume set. Mm-hmm. And so those, the first one was like the finished work, and the second one was supposed to be the drawings and the preparatory work, all the comps I do, and oh, okay. I, other ideas to show the process. Right. And, you know, some how-to sections and stuff. But mm-hmm. DreamWorks, they went bankrupt while, that, while Uvra was on the book from China, believe it or not. Wow. On the, Dream Wave. On the boat from China. Yeah, whatever it was called. <laughs> <laughs> But they went they're, bankrupt. They're bankrupt. You know? They're not going to sue you for getting their name wrong. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they don't exist. So there was never a second book, and I never even saw a dime for the first book. Wow. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, That's so. sad. That's criminal. Well, actually, it was, it was kind of more than, because I put a whole lot of my own money into the book, so I never even broke even. Hmm. So, no, there's, <laughs> there's not another book, because wow. every time I do something, it's once. You know, okay. maybe if if some other publisher comes around and, and can prove to me they're a lot more sincere than that last guy was. And a lot more stable, right? Yeah, then I might think about it. But it takes a good year to put the book together. You sure. Know? I mean, you got to work with a writer. you got to collect all the pictures, which is, is a really big ordeal. Mm-hmm. And then it's got to be designed and, and all, you know, laid out. And it's, it's, it's a lot, a lot of work. Right. I had done about half of it for the the second volume, and then it just died. But mm. so there's nothing in the works, you know. I think that's the kind of thing somebody will do when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> They'll get it all wrong, but that's okay. Right. Well, that's your son's there for you. He'll carry in the torch exactly. and the legacy, and make sure they yeah, make sure yeah. they get the spelling of your name right. Does Dad proud? <laughs> well, that's like all those those biographies about written by people that never even met the artist. Right, <laughs> right. and you wonder. <laughs> and they're telling you why he did what he did and how he felt. Said, how do you know? He walked down 3rd Street, and that's when the idea came to him. It's like, okay. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> so it's, it's like, that's why I don't explain myself that much, because, you know, it takes a lot of explanation for people to understand why an artist does what an artist does. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a different kind of thing. It's like the old thing about Mount Everest, because he can. That's why an artist does what he does. Well, yeah, it's got a lot to do with it. Mar- <laughs> Marvin Gaye said that if a person is a true artist, then their goal, is singular goal, is is to open the minds of men and women. That's their goal. And I guess to get paid along the way. But anyway. <laughs> Well, yeah, and whenever you read anything artists write, that's basically what they will tell you. Yeah. It's like trying to explain, like, art or a painting or an illustration to somebody, I always say it's, it's like you're doing it injustice because it's a visual language. Mm-hmm. You read it, you understand it, and appreciate it visually. To put it into words is like translating it, and it's, you know, translations are never accurate, mm-hmm. and they're never really specific. You know, paintings worth a thousand words, well, you know, every aspect of it would take a thousand words to try to explain. Right. But if you just look at it, experience it, sit in front of it, let it seep into your heart, and then it'll give you its message. And its message is not a verbal message, it's an emotional message. So if you get the feelings, like most people do, it's it's happy, it's sad, it's beautiful, I enjoy it, perks me up, you know. I I have a friend that bought one of my paintings in a show I had, and... And he was hanging in his living room, and he really loved it because he's an artist, too, and he really understood it. And Then his wife divorced him and took absolutely everything he had, the house, the kids, oh. everything, his bank account. And he says, look, I just want one thing out of this marriage. I want my painting. Wow. So he kept my painting. <laughs> wow. And he told me, years later, he's got a little apartment. It's got no furniture in it, but the painting hangs on the wall. Yeah. He goes to work every day, and when he comes home from work, after being beat up by the boss, having no family anymore, being sad and tired and hungry right. and unhappy. He'd sit down in front of that painting, and every day he would feel better just by looking at the picture. I says, now that's what art is for. It is. Wow. And so, you know, I remember little stories like that because they get it. They do. And that's what it's for. And it doesn't have to be explained because it's, it's an emotional feeling, sensing kind of thing. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, that's interesting. Wow. Uh and it's not the only one, but that's that's one little story for today. Right. 
We appreciate that. Um, if I might ask, I, I was really moved by the, uh, the parts of, of, of Uber where you, you know, they talked about when you met your wife and you guys dating and you were a young art student and struggling and, and your commitment to what you were doing, maybe in some cases making some foolish decisions, but, uh, as we all do, <laughs> where did I make a foolish decision? <laughs> well, right. <laughs> but apparently didn't stop you from your path that you were destined to go to anyway. So, you know, yeah. But I, I thought it was really interesting and very sweet, you know, you talking about how you guys met and and she was saying, you know, you were, you know, you were eating like just a couple of days a week and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. you know, what guy? You know, I don't know if I was doing that when I was 20. I don't know if I would have done that if I was 20 when I was 20 in in, in art school. But well, uh, I well, did, sir. That's in there to get a little insight. I am peculiar. There's no question about it. Yeah. You know. I, I was, somebody sent me an email the other day, and at the bottom he put a little quote. I can't remember who it's from. It said something like, those among us who have vision and passion are usually hated by the rest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of my life, you know. I, I, I never had a friend in school because I was peculiar, you know. I was so dedicated. Everybody else would go out to go up on the Sunset Boulevard, you know, in the 60s and party and have drugs and everything. And I sat home and painted, you know. Of course, I didn't have any money or any food, so I couldn't so go you, with So you anyway. couldn't buy the drugs or the, do yeah, the party. Yeah, so I, I, I couldn't go money. party, but, <laughs> right. but I liked what I was doing. I always knew I wanted to be an artist from the time I can remember remembering. I enjoy it. It I do it because it pleases me, and it also pleases other people, and right. it turns out it also makes me a living. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's... and. I do it every day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and so I got, you know, I'm introverted and I'm quiet and mind my own business, you know, pretty simple person. But people find me kind of hard to understand, you know. So. I don't. I think you've taken several layers off of the, I mean, you, oh, yeah. you demystified some of the things that we right. were thinking. We, we may earlier. have to edit this just to keep the mystique and, you know, <laughs> okay. just to keep it in place and, and, and intact. Exactly. So how would you how would you compare or would you did you ever ever have the, the fortune of having a conversation with people like Bob Peake and or um, St- Sid Mead who's also a futurist or no no, no. Bob died a few years ago right. I've met and talked with his son quite a bit okay. a really nice fellow Sid Mead I've I've never met okay. I I don't have very many friends that are artists right okay most of I mean this is probably not wise to say, and so I should, if I was really not a fool, then I wouldn't say it at all. But a lot of artists still don't like to hang around me. Okay. <laughs> I make them nervous. Okay. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because they're probably intimidated by the fact that he's such a humble guy, and he, and he he does such great work, and he's like, well, there's no great mystery to it. I just do it. Okay. Well, you think that's it? Well, I'll let you say it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just never have. Uh, recently, I have met some really nice people that are don't seem so intimidated and are very kind and we get along well and talk about art and stuff and it's it's very refreshing because I've never really had that Mm. most of my life Mm. Uh, Drew, uh, Dwight and I this show is is very art focused and and we're comics fans as well and I know you did uh, uh, some comic stuff uh, here recently Um, the Superman 800 I think it was Right. yeah I did that Uh Yeah. now that's you on the cover right? uh huh yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that was, we kind of wanted to reprise the original cover, you know, with Action him throwing the car at the tree and the, the bad guys running away. So I thought, well, I'll do that, just frame it differently, and I'll get to be one of the bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Help me. Um, I guess I, I do have one last question, and then, you know, maybe we'll wrap it up with you and let you get back to more important things. But Why aren't you going to get to the good stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, this was our A game, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not an entertainer. I'm sorry. No, no. but uh, and this is more of a personal question. But you know, I'm uh, Dwight has a girlfriend. I'm a married guy. I've been married for 14 years, and obviously, you've been married for probably 40 some odd years. Exactly, 40 years. Yeah. Any advice for a guy who you've, you've <laughs> lapped maybe twice or three times? Uh, you know. Uh, you know what can I look forward to it in forty something years that I'm you know maybe I'm not We're seeing it on right now right? yeah <laughs> uh, well that that's cool um it's how I live my life I mean there is more to me than just painting but yeah. 
it's it's fairly simple and if you if you say simply what it is um people would say oh you don't know what you're talking about but it's it's like the two greatest commandments love god love your neighbor those are the greatest commandments oh that's simple try it sometime right you know right. what keeps a marriage together keeps it vital keeps you happy keeps you satisfied it's loving your mate mm. it's not being selfish no. it's caring about them about their happiness about their wants and their needs and because it makes you happy to make them happy and that's mm. called love mm. and it's not something it's that it hits you in the head and go oh i think i'm in love how do i know when i'm in love it's a choice it's and and you work at it because, mm-hmm. as you know, people, you'll see they're different than you, and you learn to understand each other, and you learn to appreciate the differences, and you learn to care about how they feel, and, and you have to work at it every day. Mm-hmm. If you don't, your own selfishness and your own greed will take over, and you'll start thinking poor things, and it'll fall apart. So you have to consciously want to love somebody to be able to make it work. Mm. Wow. Well, there Ain't we go. that hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you put it very eloquently for a guy who doesn't consider himself a wordsmith. So. Well, you know, the principles of life are easy to understand and easy to outline. But if they were easy to practice, it would be a better world. Right. Everybody um, would do it and it would be you know, a better place. Yeah, it would be nice if everybody would do it. But everybody doesn't so it's not as good a place as it could be but that just you know it only gets better one person at a time so you can choose to do it if you know it's your choice then you can make it your choice wow well drew you're definitely profound drew and i don't i, I mean <laughs> for a regular guy <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know well i told you i can get weird on you i'm trying to be real pc right now no that's no, cool let your hair down baby go ahead you haven't listened to our podcast have you <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of weird guys oh uh, well, it's okay well, it's been really awesome and fantastic and wonderful and to chat with you and and we're, Dwight and I are extremely grateful that you took time to talk with Definitely, us. Definitely, sir. And, uh, well, it's, I'm happy to speak with anybody, and you guys especially. You've been very nice. Well, I, we appreciate that. And uh, I know your site is drewstruzen.com mm-hmm. for those who you know need to go. If you don't know, you need to know. You need to know. And go to the, well, uh, it's a very simple little site. Yeah. But, um, Simply incredible. <laughs> for those and, that are listening. And, and good luck with the, with the new indie project, Indie 4. It, you should learn it's not a matter of luck. <laughs> okay. It's a matter of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> well, lots of money and success and, 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 and lots of smiles in, 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 uh, uh, with Indy 4 and with uh, uh, Frank Darabont's movie as well, uh, The Mist. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's going to be cool. Yeah, And, you know, you talked about did you know it was going to be a cool movie while you were working on it? Yeah. Yeah, Indy's going to be cool. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm having a good time on it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And he's back, and he's bad. Awesome. And um, well, anyway, we, we're going to go ahead and let you go, and, and and let you get on with the evening. But again, thanks again for chatting. That concludes this episode of Sidebar Forever, hosted by Dwight Clark, Swain Hunt, and Adrian Johnson. You can find us online at sidebarforever.com. Any emails or questions can be directed to us at sidebarforever at gmail.com. And also, subscribe to us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Sidebar Forever is copyright 2020. Dwight Clark, Swain Hunt, and Adrian Johnson.